I was there. The day Horus slew the Emperor. Garviel Loken. In the fading light of the 31st millennium, the furious blaze of the Great Crusade simmered down to mere embers. Upon the alien world of Olinor, the Astartes waged a brutal war on the Orc Empire. Among them, the Lunar Wolves, the spear tip of the Astartes, had carved their name into history with blood and steel. This war was not one of political maneuvering or advanced weaponry. It was a visceral clash of ideology and primal brutality, waged against the savage Orc race. Towering Orc constructions loomed over the desolate battlefield, seemingly bound together by nothing more than scrap metal and the crude psychic force known as the Wa. In a twisted echo of the Mechanicum's devotion to the Machine God, these crude engines of war were fueled by the Orcs' sheer lust for battle. This fervor juxtaposed sharply with the enlightenment of the Emperor's imperial truth, held high by the Astartes, though their superior weaponry was similarly maintained by the mysterious pseudo-religious rituals of the Mechanicum. In this theater of blood and grime, the Lunar Wolves displayed their prowess, every super-soldier a testament to their Primarch's gene seed. The favored son of the Emperor Horus himself guided the Legion, positioning them at the vanguard of the Crusade. With the newest Mark IV armor and Terminator suits at their disposal, the Lunar Wolves were the first to engage with lost civilizations, the first to shine under the spotlight of fame and envy. Yet, unbeknownst to them, they were sowing the seeds of their eventual downfall, leading to a schism that would necessitate a complete reformation of the Astartes' structure. With Olinor subdued, the Lunar Wolves turned their gaze towards the fringes of the Imperium, the far-flung stars where wayward human civilizations clung to existence. They found themselves drawn into a vast empire governed by a pretender to the Emperor's throne. Horus, however, wished to steer his legion away from a bloody war. He saw the twilight of the Crusade on the horizon, foreseeing a future of diplomacy and peace. The Lunar Wolves, notorious for their spear-tip assaults, had to learn to temper their inherent violence for the inevitable change. On Darwin, a world dominated by a false emperor, the Lunar Wolves were once again called upon to enforce the Emperor's will. Despite their desire for a peaceful transition, they were thrust back into the carnage they were all too familiar with. But even the brightest flames must flicker. As the fury of the Great Crusade dwindled into its twilight hours, the Emperor, his visage a mask of inscrutable intent, withdrew to the sanctity of terror. An enigmatic shroud enveloped him as his attentions turned to a project of such secrecy, not even his cherished sons, the Primarchs, were afforded a glimpse into its depths. With the Emperor's gaze turned inwards, his once omniscient guidance was missed. The administrative reins fell into the hands of the Council of Terror, bureaucrats who tried in vain to mimic the virtuoso. But they were mere mortals, susceptible to the worst of human follies, greed and corruption inept in curbing humanity's inherent shortcomings. The grand orchestra of the Great Crusade that once roared across the universe dwindled to a melancholic melody. Yet, the universe abhors a vacuum. In the Emperor's absence, a figure had to rise, a leader to stoke the embers of the Great Crusade. Horus, the favored son, one of the first among the Primarchs to be reunited with his father, was chosen. Upon him was bestowed the title of War Master, a mantle of colossal expectations. This title, a double-edged sword of power and responsibility, now lay in Horus's grip, the fate of the entire Imperium held in balance. In the gloaming hours of the 30th millennium, the stage was set for the dramatic acts that would echo through the eons to come. Two centuries had passed since the genesis of the Great Crusade. Horus, the newly anointed War Master, felt the tendrils of change stirring in his heart. Fresh from their savage victory over the loathsome green tide of orcs at Ulanor, the Lunar Wolves stood poised on the precipice of a new epoch. Theirs was an existence spent in the gore-soaked trenches of brutal war, a crucible that forged them into the Emperor's most fearsome instrument. But Horus sensed the dawning of a new era, 
one pregnant with opportunity and fraught with peril. Little did he realize that the transformation he yearned for was a harbinger of unimaginable tragedy, a turning point that would catapult the Astartes into an age of eternal night. The unpredictable tempests of the warp hurled the 63rd expedition on an unforeseen trajectory. Some whispered that this was the malevolent machinations of chaos, others dismissed it as mere cosmic chance. On arrival, they found themselves facing an isolated empire, ruled by a man who claimed himself emperor of mankind, the ruler of nine defiant worlds. This false emperor, his lineage rooted in the Age of Strife, had safeguarded humanity's flame against the storm-tossed darkness of the warp. His eyes gleamed with dreams of a unified human empire, reaching out to the stars under his leadership. But his hubris and utter ignorance of what was about to bestow upon him proved his undoing. When Horus' emissaries, Astartes' diplomats clad in ceramite, were butchered in the false emperor's palace, the war master's heart sank in anguish. Among the slain was Sir Janus, a trusted confidant and a valued voice on Horus's war council. The sting of his death cut deeper, for he was not merely a warrior, he was a son, a creation born of Horus's own genetic legacy. Yet a spark of restraint flickered in the heart of the War Master. Known for favoring diplomacy's olive branch as much as war's flaming sword, Horus resolved to grant the false emperor one last chance for peaceful surrender. Despite the corrosive pain of loss, the War Master delivered an ultimatum to the pretender this time with the implied threat of a clenched fist behind the extended hand. But the Emperor was resolute in his defiance. There would be no parley, only unconditional submission. Thus, 600 Imperial warships plunged from the heavens. No more negotiations, no more compromises. The Pretender's Empire was to be purged in purifying fire. The Lunar Wolves fought with a vengeance, their fury echoing through the besieged palace, their wrath a response to their fallen brothers. Each inch of their advance was bought with the lives of the Pretender's elite guard, shrouded in stealth fields and armed with arcane weapons that could pierce even the Astartes' formidable power armor. They fought with a ferocity only bred in the crucible of war, ascending towards the throne room. The enemy was formidable, wielding arcane weapons that threatened even Astartes' armor. As the Lunar Wolves breached the throne room, a cataclysmic weapon was unleashed, tossing them about like leaves in a storm. The scene was one of chaos and death, warriors crushed beneath their own armor, lives snuffed out in shattered glass and pools of blood. Yet when all hope seemed lost, a piercing light cleaved the gloom. In a flare of teleportation energy, Horus appeared, his towering figure silhouetted against the radiant warp light. His bolter roared, punching a hole through the false emperor and his golden throne. Horus, resplendent and majestic, stood amidst the chaos, a titan amongst men. Smoke curling from the smoldering corpse, he bellowed his proclamation to the heavens, and so will I deal with all tyrants. Part 1 the difference between gods and demons largely depends upon where one is standing. Primarch Logar Historical accounts suggest that in this age, the Astartes were not ignorant of the taint of chaos, having fought the corrupted psychers and planetary infestations that it bred. They knew the dangers of the warp, and the vulnerability of those who dared to navigate its treacherous currents. However, it was during this time that the corrupted Blade of Chaos carved a fresh wound into the Lunar Wolf's history. Captain Loken, newly appointed Mournival Council member to Horus and commander of the Tenth Company, bore witness to a brother's fall. Xavier Jubal, once a trusted brother, fell prey to the insidious influence of Chaos. It was in the shadow of the Whisperheads, a bastion held by fanatical defenders rebelling against the Imperium, which Jubal's fall would send shockwaves through the Astartes, revealing a dark secret that had been hidden from them for centuries. The Lunar Wolves had descended upon the Whisperheads like avenging angels, equipped in their newly minted Terminator armor. 
Their fellow Astra Militarum Imperial soldiers had faltered against the enemy for weeks, taking heavy casualties as they had fought for every inch of the battlefield. The Astartes had extinguished the lives of the 978 defenders in a mere 68 minutes without suffering a single loss. It was a grim reminder of the vast gulf between them and the beleaguered Astra Militarum soldiers. Yet even amidst this victory, a sinister whisper echoed in their minds, Samus is the man beside you. Samus is death. It was a voice that could be heard over the comms to all those on the field. It was clever tools of propaganda deployed by the enemy, Loken had assured his fellow brothers. And yet doubt seeped into his mind as his entourage, those not linked into the communication system, could hear the voice echoing in their mind. Samus is coming. Crackling over the comms was fellow brother Astartes Jubaul, a man seemingly lost in hallucinations, his voice hauntingly disconnected from reality. Speaking of things unseen, and echoes of a voice which they could all hear worming its way into their thoughts. Samus is speaking, he muttered over and over again. Lucan ordered him restrained. I am Samus, he proclaimed, his voice full of a power not his own, and unleashed a salvo of rounds into his fellow Astartes. The rounds punched bloody cavities into their armored chests. Skulls exploded into a gory cloud of red and fragments of bone. Astartes fell one after the other, brothers cut down by their kin. This was not just a violation of law, but a shattering of sacred bonds. It was a moment that would reverberate through eternity, a horrifying spectacle of brotherhood torn asunder. Still, even as the gravity of the unthinkable unfolded before them, none of the remaining brothers moved to restrain him. Loken, gripped by determination, lunged at Jubaul, even as the rogue Astartes continued his deadly fusillade, his bolts biting into ceramite and flesh alike. Loken met Jubaul with all the strength an Astartes could muster, each strike capable of ending a mortal life. Their power armor groaned and chipped under the ferocious impact as they grappled for supremacy. Jubaul, fueled by an otherworldly strength, could not be pinned. He threw off his would-be restrainers, sending them sprawling like discarded toys. Their blades met in a maelstrom of raw power and violent intent, forcing Loken to adopt a desperate reactionary defense. The man he knew as a brother was lost to a monstrous aggressor, unmatched in his frenzy. Their grim ballet of war continued until Jubaul, in a triumphant roar of I am Samus, plunged his sword into Loken's shoulder, but it was a pyrrhic victory. For in doing so, he presented an opening to Loken. With a grim set to his jaw, Loken drove his sword through Duval's chest, the point erupting from his backplate. Samus is done, Loken spat, his words a bitter elegy to a fallen brother. The Lunar Wolves had been exposed to a dark secret and the ghost of a threat they had only begun to comprehend. As the echo of Duval's final words rang in their ears, they were forced to reckon with the reality of the darkness within their ranks. As the Great Crusade swept across the galaxy, the Astartes legions often served as vanguards, the spear tip that thrust into the heart of new civilizations long disconnected from terror. Just as often, they unearthed the decrepit remains of societies, their sparks snuffed out by unknown calamity. Their duties varied as the worlds they encountered. Sometimes they were to confront giant bipedal lizard warrior species, who were ferocious as they were tough. On one occasion, they uncovered a sentient machine society. The civilization that birthed them, a forgotten whisper kept alive by the roaming AI left in the wake of their lost civilization. These machines were considered heresy and stamped out in a costly campaign by the Mechanicum. On another occasion, Loken, council member to Horus and captain in the Lunar Wolves, led his Astartes through an intricate maze of subterranean habitats on a world long devoid of life. 
The only testament to its past inhabitants was a map of terror buried deep beneath the surface. It was an anachronistic artifact, showing a terror long lost to time. It held the echo of coastlines and mountains drowned in the relentless march of civilization. It provoked questions with no answers, all lost to a mysterious cataclysmic event. Despite the immunity to fear bred into his very genes, the unsettling absence of life and the inexplicable existence of the terror map stirred unease in him. Reeling from the horrors of the encounter with Zeva Jubaul, Loken sought the presence of the renowned Iterator Sindaman. Sindaman, a master orator, was revered across the Imperium for his insatiable quest for knowledge and his deep understanding of the human psyche. Are spirits real? Can a man truly be possessed? Loken found himself asking Sindaman, his voice barely above a whisper. Saviors, transformation, the inhuman strength, the violence, and the madness, the images haunted him, and he needed answers. Zindaman looked at Loken, his gaze steady, eyes gleaming with a tranquil confidence. He dismissed Loken's question with a logical explanation. A malfunction of the gene seed, a debilitating disease that drove him to madness and violence, he offered. Zindaman's words were crafted to soothe, to dispel the terrifying possibility of the supernatural. But despite the iterator's conviction, Loken's disquiet lingered, a seed of doubt firmly planted. That seed would grow into a terrifying reality when they both bore witness to Xavier's grotesque resurrection. The once proud Astartes, bound and grievously wounded, now stood as a mutated abomination, his humanity ravaged by the warp's touch. His form expanded and twisted in ways that did not make sense, as he seemed to flicker within the spectrum of reality, his flesh bloating and rotting and his eyes became pools of blood. Loken emptied his bolter into the monstrous entity Duval had become. The deafening sound of ninety bolter rounds from fellow brothers nearby tore through the silence, their deadly song matching the grotesque dance of death that was Duval's final moments. They burned the remains, ensuring that the nightmare was truly over. Yet the night's revelations weren't over. Horus, the Warmaster himself, shared the bitter truth with Loken, a truth known to the Emperor and a select few, of the warp and the grotesque entities lurking within its depth. Loken's mind, already stretched to its limits, grappled with the new revelation. This was the universe's dark secret, a secret he now shared. The Great Crusade, he realized, was not just a war for reuniting humanity. It was a war against the nightmarish entities that lurked in the shadowy corners of existence, and it was a war they could ill afford to lose. Lucan had stood face to face with the abominations of the warp, the ghostly specters that invaded the minds of unshielded psychers, yet his experience had never extended beyond that. Horus, his countenance unreadable, echoed Loken's sentiment. There is a stark truth, Loken, he began. None can claim to truly understand the warp, not even the Emperor himself. We exploit the warp, harnessing it as a conduit between the stars, but it is so much more. It teems with potent untamed energy, neither good nor evil but raw and primordial. The warp births apparitions, demonic specters that suggest an archaic cosmic scheme one formed by gods and the supernatural. But we Astartes have cast off the superstitious shackles that once bound humanity. We see these warp spawn not as spirits or demons, but as echoes of a realm we scarcely comprehend. These are not new threats, but simply old fears cloaked in alien form, intrusive entities that impinge upon our reality in ways we struggle to fathom. There are no gods lurking in the void, no malevolent overseers, no absolute evil, the cosmos is too sterile for such melodrama. All that exists are aberrations, and we must erase them just as we do any Xenos threat. Horus's words were said with conviction, an ironclad belief that left no room for doubt. He explained how the warp was close to the surface of the planet, crafting myths and legends of ancient horror. The warp was let loose, and you paid the price. Dubal was vulnerable, his anger leaving gaps for the warp to exploit. Samus was a voice from that realm, anchoring itself to the flesh of Xavier. There was a warp storm just before the incident, 
The data is undeniable. Why is so little known about the warp? Loken found himself asking, his voice barely more than a whisper. Because so little can be comprehended, replied Horus. Another failed attempt at a peaceful resolution weighed heavy on the War Master. The burden of his calling bestowed upon him by the Emperor insinuated itself into Horus like a blackened vine. It twisted and coiled, a serpent in his mind, quietly strangling the unblemished loyalty he once held. A seed of doubt was planted, whispered into the fertile darkness of his thoughts by the merest suggestion of the impossible. Only the Emperor could broker peace, while he, the mighty Horus, was bound to the bloody drumbeat of war. This insidious seed sprouted, nourished by his desperate hunger to equal the Emperor, blinding him with a raw, gnawing obsession. It was a creeping poison, a malignant growth that spread its tendrils through his spirit, which would eventually seduce him onto a path of irrevocable damnation. Part 2 you are walking along the shores of a lake, Cinderman said to Loken. A boy is drowning. Do you let him drown because he was foolish enough to fall into the water before he had learned to swim? Or do you fish him out and teach him how to swim? Loken shrugged. The latter. What if he fights you off as you attempt to save him? Because he is afraid of you. Because he doesn't want to learn how to swim? I save him anyway. Private conversation between Captain Loken of the Lunar Wolves and primary iterator Cinderman. The War Master had his secrets, his unseen vulnerabilities hidden beneath a facade of steely command. Only a select few were allowed past this barrier. His Mournival, a small council of veteran Astartes, served as his closest confidants, advisors and mirrors to his own tumultuous thoughts. However, a schism was starting to spiderweb its way through the once solid foundations of the Mournival. Horus, striving to decipher the Emperor's will towards peace, was beginning to paint with broader, more complicated strokes. A few among his trusted council, however, rebuffed this change. The pushback twisted the air with tension, sparking fierce disputes that etched lines of resentment on the face of their unity. The War Master's tolerance had its limits. He bore his fangs, reminding the Mournival that he was the appointed executor of the Emperor's will. His word was law his decisions final. But tensions had risen and with it the beginnings of a fragmentation of the Mournival. These would not be the only tensions that Horus must contend with. The Primarchs, demigods wrought from the Emperor's own flesh, bore the complex ties of siblinghood, a maelstrom of rivalry, envy, affection, and deep-rooted love. Horus and Sanguinius, the Lord of the Blood Angels, shared a bond forged in the crucible of battle and camaraderie. It was a relationship of mutual respect, a playful dance tempered by solemn gravity when the situation demanded. Sanguinius, beloved by the stars themselves, emanated kindness and charisma, standing as a beacon amidst the cosmos as the head of the Ninth Legion. Sanguinius counseled his brother. He saw the fractures amongst the Primarchs, a chasm that Horus must bridge. Dissent and rivalry, he warned, could not be allowed to fester, Horus, however, roared against this council. There were those of his brothers he confided in and trusted, he exclaimed, such as Dawn and Gilliman, both military geniuses. Indeed, Rogel Dawn was perhaps the most finest military mind of all the Primarchs, and where Dawn was reserved and resolute, Horus, who was flamboyant and charismatic. It was said that Dawn was the unmovable object, and Horus was the unstoppable force. But becoming War Master had sowed discontent among the brothers, especially from those who felt it should be theirs. Angron was unhappy and jealous. Russ and Lion were cynical but resolved, and Fulgrim's unabashed arrogance was teetering on insolence that mocked the unity they stood for. But Sanguinius persisted, his words carrying a soft insistence that masked their steel. He implored Horus to accept the Emperor's gift, to announce the Lunar Wolves as the Sons of Horus, and thereby reveal the trust and power granted to them by the Emperor himself, and soothe the concerns of his brothers.
In the twilight hours of the Great Crusade, the Remembrancers joined the Astartes legions at the spearhead of war. These sanctioned historians, scribes of the cosmos, were entrusted with the task of etching these pivotal epochs into the bedrock of history, creating glimmers of truth within the murky depths of the imperial narrative. They were viewed by the Astartes with trepidation, perceived as bureaucratic encroachment and harbingers of changing times. However, it was through their records that the Astartes were revealed as individuals, each with their own idiosyncrasies and strengths. Some humorous, some stern, some renowned for their swordsmanship, others for their mastery of the bolt gun. They were more than weapons, they were individuals, and this humanity would soon prove to be both their greatest strength and most profound vulnerability. Among the distinguished individuals accompanying the Great Crusade were the iterators, masterful orators and skilled persuaders. They spun narratives of propaganda, broadcasting the imperial truth throughout the farthest reaches of the galaxy, bolstering morale, and propagating the Emperor's divine mandate. As per the instruction of Warmaster Horus, these iterators were also entrusted with the education and guidance of the Astartes during the expansive voyages between worlds. The process of becoming an iterator was even more demanding than that of an Astartes, where one in a thousand might be physically and mentally robust enough to withstand the integration of flesh and bone into armor, only one in a hundred thousand could aspire to the intellectual and rhetorical prowess demanded of an iterator. Among these exceptional individuals, one name stood apart, Sindeman, primary iterator of the 63rd expedition. Revered by all, it was said that even the emperor held him in high esteem, entrusting his guidance to his favored son, Horus. It was in Sindeman's discourse with Captain Loken of the Lunar Wolves, a trusted confidant of Horus, that we glimpse the true individuality of the Astartes. In a secluded exchange, Loken, already troubled by the increasing influence of the Lodges and the insidious tendrils of chaos, was provoked by Sindeman to reflect upon his place within the Imperium. Loken confessed, as a warrior, he was a man of conscience, driven by unwavering faith in the Emperor and his cause. Yet as a weapon, he was devoid of conscience, existing only to kill until instructed otherwise. In these times of bloodshed and savagery, he didn't question, for a weapon had no need of such faculties. However, Sindeman urged him to remember that a time of peace would follow the war, and warriors like Loken must be ready for a galaxy in which a weapon would not be enough. Such was Horus's optimism, and the task he set for Sindeman. Yet the peace that was promised seemed a dwindling fantasy and many brother Astartes believed that the Imperium was destined for the eternal night of war. Sindeman left Loken with a final musing. When empires defy us, it is necessary to bring down the Imperial Fist upon them, and the Astartes are indeed the armored gauntlet of this force. However, we must not forget that the Fist can also be an open hand of friendship. Sindeman leaned closer to Loken, whispering, We are mighty because we are just and not the other way around. Never forget that. These words of caution echoed a bloodstain on the Imperium, a time marred in secrecy known to few, in which the Thunder Warriors which came before the Astartes were wiped out, because they could only be a fist, but never the open hand. Deep within the gargantuan bowels of the Astartes war vessels, secret meetings were held, veiled under the guise of lodges, these clandestine gatherings were not sanctioned by the Emperor, and the Primarchs who were aware of their existence merely turned a blind eye. Loken, however, was disturbed by these secret councils. A bitter taste filled his mouth at their mention. For him, they were a malignant growth nestled deep in the heart of every legion, a cancer that could prove deadly. Yet, he had discovered that even in his own company, Many members, from Astartes to those at the very top of the War Master's Council, belonged to these lodges. His comrades of the Mournival, also clandestine attendees of the Lodge, attempted to placate him. They described the Emperor as a figure so far removed from the human experience that he could not comprehend their need for brotherhood. They spoke of their aspirations, their doubts, which they could express as equals within the Lodge without fear of punishment or retribution. They proclaimed that the Lodge maintained the Legion's pulse, 
promoted understanding across the ranks, and ultimately made them formidable in combat. The Mournivals spoke of the Lodges as ancient institutions, predating even the Unification Wars, where Astartes could share stories without the formalities and hierarchy that their service demanded. Loken felt a wave of uncertainty wash over him. He had misjudged this thing, but the nagging concern remained. He feared the secrets they might be willing to keep when bound by loyalty to their clandestine brotherhood and shielded by darkness, free from the cleansing scrutiny of open discourse. And so, Loken knew, he felt it in his bones, that these lodges were a hidden danger, a silent storm gathering beneath the clear skies of unity, a looming shadow threatening the very foundation of their brotherhood. But little did he know that from these lodges, chaos would seep into the very fabric of the Astartes Brotherhood and bring the Imperium to its knees. Part 3 We are mighty because we are right. We are not right because we are mighty. Vile the hour when that reversal becomes our credo. Primary Iterator Cinderman In the long shadow of history, Horus, the ill-fated Warmaster, was often seen merely as a brute, a warrior, a hulking spectre of war. Yet this understanding shrouded the truth in a veil of ignorance. Horus was not simply a pawn of chaos, but a grand chess master, a virtuoso of the political grand stage. He bore not just the steel of a warrior, but the guile of a seasoned politician, the introspection of a philosopher at war with himself, and the persuasive allure of a diplomat. When the time came to admonish his fellow legions, he did not wield his fist, but turned instead to his most cunning weapon, the Mournival. Like hounds, they were unleashed, their snarls echoing the discord that Horus intended to knit into unity under his own shadowed banner. The grand theater of war played out, a maddening pantomime that veiled Horus's machinations, even as scorn simmered for his counsel. The aftermath of a war, bloody and grueling, had etched itself into the steel of Horus's resolve. Across two embattled planets, his war machine had roared, leaving naught but ashes in its wake. It was here, amid the aftermath, that the War Master found an opportunity for redemption, a phoenix rising from the ruins, cloaked in the majesty of a newly discovered empire, the Interrex. They were an empire gleaming like a rare jewel amidst the infinite expanse of space, were his chance to clasp the elusive hand of redemption. The Interrex were a grand spectacle of civilization, their societies shimmering with advanced technology, as majestic and graceful as the soaring spires that pierced their skies. Yet beneath this veneer of civilization, the Interrex harbored a deep-seated paranoia, their suspicion wound tight around their every action. Horus's diplomatic envoy was met with the cold, silent indifference of stagnation, the Interrex stalling, a creeping dread coiling its way through their dealings. The Interrex bore the gene seed of terror, a shared ancestry that tethered them to the same hallowed ground as the Imperium. They held terror in a sort of awe, a reverence that could be a bridge to bond them with Horus's relentless expeditionary force. Yet, trepidation clung to their hearts. How could they trust one who bore the title of War Master? A title that rumbled with the thunder of war, a stark antithesis to the tranquil philosophy of the Interrex. The veneer of peace began to crack, as sinister undercurrents stirred beneath the surface. Uncertainty rippled through the ranks, the coming storm brewing in the hearts of warriors and diplomats alike. For even amid the triumphant fanfare of discovery, the shadow of the War Master loomed large, casting a pall of fear and doubt over the promised unity of the New Age. At the onset of their dealings with the Interax, discordant voices close to the War Master called for war. Their tolerance for the Xenos engendered a chilling horror within the War Council. Horus, ever the Stoic, eased his council's fears. His voice, steady amidst the rising tensions, decreed that the Interax should not and will not be subjugated. A steely resolve flashed in his lupine eyes, a refusal to repeat the mistakes of the past. He reminded his council of the two centuries that had passed since the height of the Civil War, and that violence was no longer their only recourse. 
He would not succumb to the ruthless dictates of an ideological creed others believed the Emperor set. In the shadows of the strategy room, Horus found solace with his confidence. There was Loken, a loyalist in temperament and conviction, and Sanguinius, his angelic brother who could be said to be his most trusted confidant. In a rare moment of vulnerability, Horus opened his heart and spoke of a fond memory of his time with his father, the Emperor. His words weaving an image of an ancient Terran astrological book, a gift from his father. The tome catalogued celestial zodiacs, each a symbol of humanity's ambition, determination and strength. I told him I liked them all, Horus recounted, his voice echoing in the chamber. Each one represented a different aspect I admired. His father had prophesied that the twenty Primarchs would exemplify the twenty Zodiacs, and Horus would be the Sagittary, the warlike horseman. It was a figure revered in ancient Terran mythology, unyielding and resilient. As he considered his path, Horus gazed at his ring, an artifact from the time of the Emperor's birth, adorned with the Sagittary. His destiny was clear. In the Emperor's absence, he would guide the Astartes, and the Imperium. This story is an important tale in the annals of the heresy, but one often overlooked, for it tells us of a man, well-rounded, full of ambition and desires to better himself and serve his father. And yet, the cruel mistress of destiny would overshadow the man, and set him on the path of destruction and inner turmoil. He was the chosen one, a destiny written in the stars, yet he was deeply insecure that he shoulder such a burden. As the crusade neared its conclusion, the mantle of leadership weighed heavily upon his soul. In a rare moment of self-disclosure, he mused, speaking with agonized vulnerability. I am war master because the emperor was busy. He had more important work than the crusade. He believed the time had come to pass the work onto the Primarchs. So he may do some unknown work, he won't tell me, he hasn't told anyone. He did not want to burden me, but I'm no fool, I can speculate. The Imperium needs the warp as its lifeblood. I believe he is unlocking the secrets and mastery of the warp, for without it we will fall. The final meeting with the Interex, designed to forge an alliance, instead became the opening act for the heresy. Horus flanked by his Mournival council members and personal bodyguards, met the Interax for the final time to broker a peace. Yet, an undercurrent of suspicion and fear permeated the meeting. They harbored deep-rooted paranoia about chaos infiltrating their society, and to them, the War Master was a mirror reflection to all they understood about chaos. During negotiations, the flames of suspicion were fanned when a dangerous weapon of chaos was stolen from their Hall of Devices. Despite their paranoia, the Interex's warriors were honorable, demanding the Astartes' disarmament. But the Astartes, with their war master on the planet, would not yield. The venerated bodyguards of Horus, alongside the steadfast Astartes warriors, tore through the Interex ranks, carving a path towards their commander. There they found him, attired in the humble garb of diplomacy, white robes and deprived of weapons and armor. He barked orders at his guards, a tempest of resolve and determination. Yet even in the thick of the melee, he sought answers, the unraveling of this tapestry of betrayal. In the smoldering ruins of the Hall of Devices, the Interax's accusations hung heavy in the air. What has happened here to cause such sudden offense? He questioned, his voice echoing in the chaos. The truth was revealed in the words of the dying guardian to the Hall of Devices. The weapon had been stolen, and they were the culprits. Horus gazed upon the devastation and recognized the precipice they now teetered on, a chasm of inevitable war. Horus screamed into the sky, Why have you tasked me with this, father? It is too hard, too much to do alone. He lamented into the inky void, a mournful aria echoing amidst the chaos. In the heart of battle, the line between the Emperor's son and the War Master blurred. In that moment, an arrow buried itself into his bicep, and an Astarte's son fell before him. He was jolted back to the raw reality of the moment. Picking up a fallen Astarte's weapon, he growled, If they are to fear us, let us give them a good reason. Illuminate them!
The day bore witness to the fury of the War Master, a tempest unmatched. He claimed his destiny, his title, with an unwavering resolve that echoed across the cosmos. His lunar wolves, his sons, would now bear a new title, one that would etch their deeds across the annals of time, the Sons of Horus. Yet even amidst his triumph, the gnawing roots of distrust and paranoia began to claw their way into his heart. Chaos, like an insidious plague, had already seeped into the Astartes, and it was only a matter of time before its malevolent grasp ensnared the War Master himself, threatening to crumble the Imperium from within. In the coming decades, the imminent fall of the War Master would bring the Imperium to its knees and tear the Astartes Legion asunder. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this tale, consider listening to the full audible book, Horus Rising by Dan Abnett. Affiliate link below.